This is Optimal Finance Daily, Episode 152, How to Buy Happiness, Part 2, by David Kane of Raptitude.com. Get ready to maximize your potential with Optimal Finance Daily, the podcast that brings you the best content in personal finance five days a week. Your optimal life awaits. Now here's your host, Dan Warren. Hey everyone, welcome back to Optimal Finance Daily, this Tuesday edition of the podcast, and uh, we're going to continue today with our post from yesterday. So if you didn't hear Monday's episode, that's uh, episode 151, you're probably going to want to go back and listen to that one first so that uh, today's makes more sense. But before we get into it, if you didn't know, this is actually one of three podcasts where we read blog posts to you. So if you like hearing amazing content from the web being read to you for free, you can check out our other two podcasts by searching for the word optimal in the podcast app of your choice, and they should show up that way. Or you can always stop by our site to learn more. Just visit oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com. And that's it for now. Let's continue the post from yesterday as we start optimizing your life. How to Buy Happiness, Part 2 by David Kane of raptitude.com. We just have to remember that it's not the money that has value. Money has no value except what you can trade it for. Most of the time we're trading our money for things, objects such as cars, shoes, and microwaves. Most of the rest of it is exchanged for services, bus rides, massages, carpet cleaning. But we purchase those goods and services only for the experiences they can lend us or spare us. Value amounts to positive experiences. Wealth is ultimately the capacity to create worthwhile experiences in life and to prevent bad experiences. There's nothing of value except experiences and assets that can continue to supply good experiences. That's all money is good for. If you can stay conscious of what the real-life value of your purchase really is in terms of the experience it offers, then you can find enormous leverage in what investments you make. That's where we can really profit. If we recognize that wealth is not actually money, it's capacity for quality of life. What really pays off depends on the person, but you can get a huge amount of mileage out of simply stopping to look at what form of value you're actually getting. All of it is going to amount to feelings anyway, but what feelings? And how long do they last? And are they going to create conditions that help to make more in the future? There's way more to be gained by finding leverage in the kinds of experiences you spend your money on than there is in trying to increase your income or trying to maximize your financial return on investment. You can shop around all day trying to make 3% on your savings instead of 2.75 and then go eat a forgettable meal at Applebee's just because it's Friday and obliterate a year's worth of gains. It's the same mentality shared by the people who drive across town to the gas station that's selling fuel a few cents cheaper. They don't know where the value lies. They react to numbers. Lessons from Chocolate For most of us middle classers, our greatest financial leverage is not in what mutual funds we buy, but in how we gauge the real-life value of our consumer purchases. You can multiply what you get out of your discretionary income by asking, what form does this value come in in terms of experiences? How long does it last? Will it leave me with some kind of value-producing asset, such as a skill or a tool? The cost of something is not limited to the amount of money you forfeit for it. Purchases often come with negative total value. Yesterday, while at the grocery store, I had a lapse and threw a large bar of dark chocolate into my basket. I'm eating it as I write this, and I'm excited for it to be gone so I don't have to look at it anymore. It's really not that great. I don't feel good right now. The best part was the first two bites, which in terms of actual value, only yields about 15 seconds of pretty modest pleasure. But it's here, and I don't really feel like putting it back in the fridge. The moment when I was in the chocolate aisle deciding which flavor to grab, That was a moment where I wielded a great amount of leverage, if only over a small amount of money. All I need to make far better investments in future scenarios like this is to stay rational when I feel urges to buy chocolate. I need to realistically assess the value of what experiences I'm actually buying. I won't argue with what chocolate adds to your life. Some people swear some of their finest moments come while experiencing chocolate, but I know for me it's a really terrible investment. The net value is less than zero. I'm a little bit fatter, all its positive value is gone, and I'm left with the liabilities. I would have gotten more net value out of throwing a $2 coin in the river than I did by eating a giant mid-quality chocolate bar by myself. Don't wait until you're in front of the chocolates to make these assessments. 
Look through some receipts. What was the real life value there? What form is it in? What remains of it? Would you rather give that value back and have the cash in hand again? What liabilities does it come with? You might think you already do this kind of evaluation, but it's unlikely. We buy things for all kinds of reasons and it's usually quite unconscious. You put something on the grocery list because you're used to having it and you're out of it. Then you buy it because it's on the list. The cycle renews itself without your ever considering what you're actually adding to your life for that money. Right beside my laptop, there are several fistfuls of receipts. A single wad of those receipts, which we tend to think of as near garbage, probably represents the expenditure of a similarly sized wad of cash in 20s and 50s. All that money is gone, and I hope my life still contains something to show for it. But most of it is probably gone without a trace. That's good news though, because I know the next wad will leave a lot more behind, if I remember that all we can ever really buy is quality of life. You just listened to part two of the post titled How to Buy Happiness by David Kane of raptitude.com. And once again, if you like the premise of this show, please do check out our other podcasts in our little optimal family. That's Optimal Living Daily and Optimal Health Daily. And you can find them wherever you're listening to this show. And that'll do it for today's episode. Have a great rest of your day and I'll be back tomorrow where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this podcast, but also Optimal Living Daily, the show where I read to you from even more blogs covering finance, productivity, minimalism, personal development, and more from incredible bloggers like Derek Sivers, Zen Habits, Mark and Angel, The Minimalists, and all the ones you hear on this show too. So if you enjoyed today's episode and like taking amazing blogs on the go, come on over to Optimal Living Daily and subscribe to that one too. And together, we'll start optimizing your life. You've been listening to Optimal Finance Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us. And remember, your optimal life awaits.